Exciting things are bubbling up behind us. Hello and welcome to GPB's live exploration, Georgia's Water. I'm your host, Ashley Mingwasser. Thanks for tuning in. Don Quixote will be airing after this, but first, it's water. The GPB education team said, exploration, but make it live. And here we are, live from Johns Creek Environmental Campus in Roswell, Georgia. And today we'll be exploring the state's fresh water systems and drinking water sources. Get ready to go with the flow. We've partnered with the Metropolitan North Georgia Water Planning District, AKA the Metro Water District, to dive into learning about all things water. During the show, you'll hear from a variety of water experts as they take you on in-depth tours of Georgia's fresh water sources and explain how that water is supplied to our homes, businesses, and schools. You'll even get to see how water is treated from our toilets to taps. Throughout the program, water experts will be available to answer your questions live. Just submit your question by sending us an email at education at gpb.org or tweet us. Send us a question via tweet using hashtag GAWaterLive. We're also going to be asking you some questions, so go ahead and get those devices out. Here is your first pop quiz. Your first question is, where is most of the world's fresh water stored? Is it lakes, glaciers, rivers, or aquifers? You only need to choose one of the following ways to vote. It's super simple. Just go to gpb.org water and select your answer, or use a cell phone to text one, two, three, or four to submit your vote to the phone number 430-206-3151. Again, you can text us the answer, one, two, three, or four, to number 430-206-3151. Now that that's out of the way, let's go exploring, shall we? Our first stop, the Chattahoochee River National Recreation Area. Hi, I'm Jerry Hightower, and as you can probably tell by this very snappy outfit, I'm a park ranger, and I work right here at the Chattahoochee River National Recreation Area. My job is to provide education and programming and to share all the joys and wonder that is the Chattahoochee River Quarter. It's absolutely fantastic. The Chattahoochee River National Recreation Area is 48 miles of the beautiful Chattahoochee River. It starts at the base of Buford Dam at Lake Lanier, and it winds down all the way to and actually into the city limits of Atlanta. And along that 48 miles, there's 16 different land units. And in these land units, there are beautiful hiking trails. And this area is designed to protect the natural and the historic and the archaeological values of this 48 miles of the Chattahoochee River Corridor. Now the Chattahoochee River starts high in the North Georgia mountains and as that water bubbles and seeps out of that sand and gravel it begins its journey down that steep mountainside and very quickly it gains more waters. Little springs and tiny tributaries add their water to it and soon it becomes a rip roaring crashing mountain stream and it goes through the city of Atlanta and continues on down and it then suddenly turns south. And at that point, it becomes the boundary between the state of Alabama and the state of Georgia. And it winds its way down and suddenly the waters of the Flint River come in to join the Chattahoochee River and it forms Lake Seminole. When it comes out of Lake Seminole, it's now in Florida and it becomes the Apalachicola River. All up and down the Chattahoochee River in the National Park, you'll see these beautiful forests. The Chattahoochee River is a good example of a freshwater ecosystem because it is fed by rain. Now don't drink our rainwater. It's really, really dirty. But when it falls in the forest, 60% of that rain is caught in the canopy and it evaporates right back up in the atmosphere. Now the remaining 40% is now smaller drops and it's falling down to the forest floor slower than when it originally started. And then on the forest floor, all the leaf litter and the pine straw grabs all that water and it soaks it up just like a sponge. And then gravity 
begins to pull all that water underground, downhill, into little streams that all flow into the Chattahoochee River. The Chattahoochee River is extremely important to the state of Georgia. It provides drinking water to more than one third of the citizens, and yet it is the smallest watershed in all of the United States serving this many people. So every single person along the Chattahoochee River affects that river and their actions or inactions are going to determine whether we have a healthy, clean river or not. It's really important that people realize that water just doesn't come out of the faucet. It comes from rivers and lakes and streams and sometimes wells drill deep into the earth. So we want to know where our water comes from so we can protect those sources and make sure that water stays clean and healthy. Well, there's lots you can do to conserve water. Some of it's very simple. When you're brushing your teeth, turn the water off while you brush. Take short showers. Always wash your dishes with the dishwasher because that uses a lot less water. Be careful about watering the lawn. Maybe it doesn't need watering at all. And so we need to be very careful with how we use water and keep in mind that we want to conserve it all the time. We always have to remember, this is all the water we're ever going to have. We never can make more water molecules. Why, the water we're drinking today is the same water the dinosaurs used. We just keep using it over and over again. And so it's critically important that we take care of this precious resource. Wow, it's amazing what we have in our own backyards. I've been so ungrateful. Joining me now is Sarah Skinner, Education and Public Awareness Coordinator at the Metro Water District. Welcome, Sarah. Thank tell you. us a little bit about the Metro Water District first, and then tell us about what you do. Sure, thanks for having me today. The Metro Water District is a regional water planning agency. We estimate how many people are gonna live in the metro region in the future, and we plan for all of the water and wastewater services that all of those people are gonna need. And we also look at how we can develop our land better so that we have fewer negative effects from stormwater runoff. And what I do with the Metro Water District is education and outreach. And that means I get to participate in fun events like this one with you. Myself and everyone you see on the program today or are just a handful of the thousands of water professionals across our state who are a critical part of keeping our water resources clean and healthy. Thousands, mm -hmm. that's incredible. And I understand the first week of May is Drinking Water Week. What that's right. a perfect time to host this show. Yes. Tell us about that. So Drinking Water Week is a national campaign. Um, it's to bring awareness to uh, keeping our water resources clean and healthy and the importance of taking care of them and the things that we can do to take care of them. And it's Drinking Water Week this week, but we can celebrate all year round. You make a good point. No time like the present to learn about our drinking water, Sarah. Well, earlier we asked our first quiz question, which was, where is most of the world's fresh water stored? Here's what our audience said. Okay. okay. Sarah, you know it. What's the right answer? The right answer is glaciers, which may be surprising since we don't have any glaciers here in Georgia. Yeah. But of all of the fresh water on Earth, 70% of that water is locked up in glaciers. Here in, in uh, Georgia, we get our water from surface water sources like lakes and rivers or from groundwater wells under the ground. Deep under the ground, really. Mm -hmm. And I understand you have, well, I see it here, you have yeah. a handy visualization to show us how the world's water supply works. You want to take us through that? Sure. So our planet is called the Blue Planet, and that's because 71% of Earth's surface is covered in water. Imagine that this picture right here represents all of the water on Earth. Well, 96% of that water would be salt water. It's in the ocean. Humans can't use it readily. Most plants and animals can't readily use it either. Um, but this right here, this amount of water represents the amount of water that's fresh that we have available on Earth. But like I said before, a lot of that water, 70%, is locked up in glaciers. Is unavailable to us. Mm -hmm. Okay, then how much of, of this water is right. actually available for us to use, to drink, to irrigate our crops, things like that? Right, so I'll take my finger. There's a little tiny drop on the end of my finger. Yes. You can see that that represents the amount of water that we have available, readily available for us to use. That's all? That's it. Okay, so water truly is a precious resource. Yes. Every drop counts, Sarah. That's right. Well, it looks like we have a question coming in from our audience. Let's get to it. It's Bryson from Miss Johnson's third grade class at Pleasant Grove Elementary. Wants to know, okay. uh, why can't people drink salt water? That's a good question. That is a good question. So much of it. 
That's right. So the salt content in salt water is way too high for our bodies to process. We could drink salt water. It's a, a treatment process that it has to go through, but that process is quite expensive and it can be costly to the environment as well. Well, we don't want to harm the environment. Right. So that's a no-no. And don't forget to send us your questions using hashtag GAWaterLive on Twitter or emailing us, education at gpb.org. We have another question here. Okay. Okay, Guy L. from Miss Hinkle's class at Oglethorpe Avenue Elementary School asks, who creates water pollution? Very good question. So unfortunately, a lot of water pollution comes from humans interacting with their environment. Take a food wrapper, for example. A food wrapper has a very useful purpose as a food wrapper. It keeps our food clean, it keeps it safe for us to eat. However, when someone tosses that food wrapper onto the ground, it becomes litter and it can wind up in our water system um, and become water pollution. So it's our fault and it's important, <laughs> it's important that we interact with our environment in positive ways. Yes. Is there a particular type of water source that we need to look at for water pollution in our environment? That's a good question. So we look at the health of our rivers, but not only our rivers. big rivers, our small streams and creeks that are feeding those big rivers. And I have a demonstration to help you understand how a river system works if you'd like to see oh, it. Oh, I would. Okay. I love a demonstration, Sarah. So hold up your fingers. Okay. Are we going to dance? We're going to dance. So the, the fingers represent the little tiny streams that are way up in the headwaters of your water system. And those streams flow into the creeks, which your arms represent. Okay. So wiggle your arms and wiggle your fingers. We have streams and we have creeks, and those streams and creeks are flowing into the river. And now point to your body. Your body represents the river. The river. Oh, yes, so I see what's happening. That is your water system. Okay, we just turned our body into a body of water. I love right. it. My last name, Mingwasser, actually means Wasser is German for water. Awesome. So perfect. And speaking of bodies, Jeremiah at Pleasant Grove STEM Elementary wants to know why the human body needs water in the first place. Back to the basics. Yes, back to the basics. So we definitely need water. Our bodies are majority made of water. 60% in fact of the human body is made up of water. So we have to have water for our joints to move, for our organs to process, and for our bodies to remove waste. Life sustaining. Mm -hmm. Water truly is life. Now let's continue our journey. This time we're headed to Clayton County, just south of Atlanta. Take a look. My name is Kevin Osby. I am the Stormwater Program Director here at Clayton County Water Authority. Stormwater is essentially just like it sounds. It's really rainwater that falls from the sky during a storm event. Most of this rainwater can soak into the ground through grasses or forests, but in a lot of areas where we have development, we have a lot of more hard surfaces such as roadways, parking lots, sidewalks, homes, buildings, in those cases, water can't soak into the ground. That tends to run off. So essentially, any of that runoff is considered storm water runoff. In most of the cases, if you are in a urban area, it will go to a catch basin. The catch basin is a roadside collection device that catches storm water runoff. From there, it takes the water underneath the ground surface and goes through a series of storm drain lines. Storm drain lines can go along roadways, off the roadways onto private properties, back into ditches that eventually will flow to either a creek, stream, tributary, or a lake. Or if you're on the coast, directly to the ocean. You pull behind someone uh, in a car and they take an ashtray and dump it out the side of their window. That's hitting the street. Well, all of that trash will eventually make its way to a catch basin and into our storm drain systems and right on out to our creeks or rivers or lakes. If you have a lot of debris and sediment and trash built up, that water won't be able to flow naturally through the storm drain. It can back up at the roadway or it can back up on someone's property and cause flooding damage. And flooding can cause all kind of other unintended consequences. For instance, if a house is flooded, water can get into that house, it can dampen the floors, it can dampen all the walls and cause mold and mildew and other health problems for that resident. Well, it is important to keep the storm drains clear of anything that ain't supposed to be in there because we need water, we drink water, we use water to cook, we use water to take a shower or bath, and, and you don't want that to get in a storm drain because what it does, it can pollute the water. And I'm pretty sure when you get home, you know, at the end of the day, you want to turn your, your water on and, and drink you some water. So it is, it's always best to keep that storm drain clean so that we can have a clean water. 
Well, the way kids can help take care of the environment is not to throw trash outside or to just litter. You know, you can't just throw anything outside. They can also educate their parents and let them know when you go in the morning, and don't 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 take that that wrap and just throw it out the window because it will end up in the storm drain. Well, some of the items we found in the storm drain: tires, rims, bicycles, different things from people's homes, trash. Um, it's very important to dispose materials because um, the materials could end up on the ground and the rain could push it into a storm drain and eventually could cause the storm drain to back up or flood. The vacuum truck, uh, basically, it is a vacuum on wheels, uh, but it's a high-pressure vacuum. It's designed to suck up debris, mud, and different objects that we find in storm drains. Uh, also, it has a high-pressure water hose on it that helps us to move those debris in position so that we can't suck them up. Once we suck up uh, the material or debris in the back truck, uh, it goes to the tank uh, where we travel to our site, uh, where we have a pit where we dump all the solids that separate from the water uh, that we're able to scoop them up and uh, take them to a landfill. One of the favorite parts about my job is to be able to see uh, happy customers. Just last week we had a major rain and one customer was flooded pretty bad and she was so relieved to see us come out and clean the pipe to get the water from her yard. Oh, what do I love about my job? What do I really love about my job is just helping the community. A drivable vacuum? I love vacuuming. Yeah. How cool is that? So we heard a lot, Sarah, about storms and why storm drains are so important in collecting and redirecting that water. But can you explain to our audience where the water comes from? Sure. So rain or precipitation is a very important part of the water cycle. And the water cycle is basically the movement of water on Earth. There are four basic steps to the water cycle, evaporation, condensation, precipitation, and collection. And there's a really simple experiment that you can do at home to help you understand this. We've taken a baggie here and pre-labeled it with the steps, and I'll explain them here. So evaporation is when, happens when the sun heats the water and uh, it rises to the air in the form of gas um, or a vapor. And then it condenses as it starts to cool back down. And when it condenses, that creates the clouds. And pretty soon, the, the water in those clouds is going to get heavy and it will fall back down to the earth in the form of precipitation or rain, sleet, and snow. And when it falls, it's going to hit the ground in uh, a larger body of water. It starts to collect up in an ocean, lake, or a river. And we call that whole process the water cycle. That's right. Because it happens over and over and over. Right. It happens over and over again. We same water over and over again. And I'll explain how to do the experiment now. So you take your bag, and you fill it up with a little bit of water up to the line that says water, this collection. And then you drop a little bit of food coloring in if you'd like to, so you can see it a little bit better. Tape it to a window that gets a lot of natural light, and then come back in an hour. In an hour. Well, mm -hmm. thankfully, in true TV fashion, mm -hmm. we've done this ahead of time. So take a look at what's happened. Explain that to us, That's Sarah. right. So the sun has heated the water inside, and it has caused the condensation to rise to the top, or the evaporation to rise to the top, and it's starting to condense, and you see a little bit of water trickling back down in the form of precipitation in our bag. Rain. Yes. Rain in a bag. Science Rain in a bag. is so cool. It doesn't get much better than that. Okay, we have a question coming in. This one's from Jason from Richmond Hill, Georgia. Jason wants to know, what material are water pipes made of? That's a great question. So water pipes are made of iron or a special kind of plastic called PVC. And I have an example right here. Let's see it. This is a PVC pipe. It's very durable, it's resistant to corrosion, and it doesn't break easily. But historically, water pipes have been made out of a variety of materials, including clay, concrete, and even wood. Even wood? Even that wood. is an interesting choice of material. Mm -hmm. Why wood? Well, so a long time ago, people would holler out a tree trunk and uh, they would use that for a water pipe or they would bind pieces of wood together uh, to make a sewer pipe. And they would use wood that was because it's naturally waterproof and it wouldn't rot easily. Oh, that's naturally mm -hmm. waterproof. Mm -hmm. How inventive. Yeah. Okay, well, we have some live questions coming in right. for mm -hmm. our audience. Let's go ahead and check those out now. Nico, a student in Miss Grove's class at Cheatham Hill Elementary, asks, if I use water for play outside, am I wasting water? That, How conscious? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you, can play, you can play in the water outside. Okay. That's part of uh, awesome summertime activities. It's part of how we connect with water, playing in the water. In times of drought, though, you might want to make sure there's no restrictions locally that would prevent you from uh, using water in that way. But in the absence of those, yes, fun to have fun. Okay. Fun to have fun. 
Good for us, Nico. That's good news. And Zeta from Amana Academy in Alpharetta, Georgia, would like to know, how long have you been doing your job, Sarah? Oh, I have been doing my job for about four years now, and I really love my job. I love talking to people, talking to the public about water conservation and stormwater pollution prevention. We love it, too. We're all filed up, fired up over here. And you're a well of information. Thank you, Sarah. I know you know the answer to our next pop quiz, but let's see if the audience knows, okay. shall we? Your next question. Which of the following is safe to go down the kitchen sink? Is it flushable wipes, medications, fats, oils, and grease, or orange juice? Don't forget to select your answer at gpb.org slash water, or you can text us two three or four to four three zero two zero six three one five one. Sarah, thank you so much for answering all of these questions Anytime. for us. We'll let them take that pop quiz. Okay, now it's time to head to our next location, which is, um, oh, it's, uh, it's right here, the Johns Creek Environmental Campus. Convenient. The Johns Creek Environmental Campus is a state-of-the-art wastewater treatment facility. It's located in Roswell, Georgia, and it services the Johns Creek Basin area, which includes parts of the cities of Roswell, Alpharetta, and the city of Johns Creek. The basic water treatment cycle is you pull water from a fresh water source in this area of the Chattahoochee River. You send it to a drinking water treatment facility. They do treatment and get it all cleaned. They send it in pipes underground to your homes and businesses. So like today, when you got up, <laughs> turned the faucet on, you used that water. It changed to wastewater. Once you used it, it goes down the sewer pipes. And unless your house is on what's called a septic system, that wastewater in those sewer lines is taken to an actual basin area. We treat it and clean it again, and then we put it right back into the Chattahoochee River so that downstream river users have water to use. When the wastewater first comes here, it comes in by gravity through pipelines that are about 60 feet underground. And it comes in through to an influent pumping area. And in that area, there are coarse screens, which the actual choppers first that chop up any solids in the water. And then when the water reaches that coarse screen, we're draining out all those things that we've chopped up. So basically what you're doing here is you're sending water to different areas. You're taking something dirty out. You're pushing the cleaner water to the next area. You're taking something dirty out and the process continues. We're then gonna send the water to what's called grit removal. And grit is gravel, sand, and rocky type sediments. That next area is called a primary clarifier. And those are basically just big basins that the water is, has time to settle. Things are settling down to the bottom, and they call that sludge. That means the cleaner water is on top, and that cleaner water also has a layer of what's called scum, fats, oils, and grease, which people shouldn't put in their sinks. And so we are constantly moving that as well as the, the remains from those screens into an actual wash factor to wash the remains and, and then get rid of it. After the water's gone through the primary clarifier, things have settled, we're gonna force that water through what are called fine screens. And the fine screens are a little different than the coarse screens because they have even smaller openings. So they're gonna catch even more things. So once the water goes through those fine screens and we get out things like hair and different really small particles, we can force that water to what's called the biological process. We call that the bug party because we're actually using the bacteria, microorganisms, and they're gonna break down and consume organic matter in that water. And so they're having their bug party because that's their food. So once they've done their job, they're also gonna remove phosphorus and nitrogen because too much of that, if, if we put that back into the river, could cause algae blooms and it could deplete the oxygen for the fish and aquatic life. So we gotta pay attention to everything we're doing because the water is ultimately going back to the river. After the biological process, we force that water through our signature process, which is called the membrane bioreactor. And basically, you have to think of it in terms of thousands of strands that look like spaghetti, 
but they're hollow. And they've got thousands of holes along the sides. And basically, we're gonna submerge all these strands in the water, and we're gonna force the water through the sides of those strands. But we're only pulling out clean water because the pore size is 0.04 microns. It's so small, it serves as a barrier and keeps the nasty stuff in the basin and pulls clean water through. That clean water is called permeate. Once that water comes out, we'll send it under what's called an ultraviolet disinfection. And basically, the ultraviolet is a very strong light that when the water goes under that light, any bacteria in there is destroyed. Now, when the water came in, it had a low oxygen level too. But we're putting it back in the river so we want it to be healthy. So we have to add oxygen or post aerate it. When the water gets to the proper levels, we put that water right back into the Chattahoochee River via an outfall and diffuser. And basically that regulates how it goes into the river so it's not too strong. People can use the river, go right over that area and not even know it's there. We're actually permitted to treat up to 15 million gallons of wastewater per day. At the end of the process, once we've treated it and cleaned it, we can use a very small percentage of it, which is called reuse. That means the water's clean enough to use. It's not drinkable grade, but it's clean enough for us to put in our toilets. We can use it for fire protection, as well as for our landscape. But the majority of that water does go right back into the Chattahoochee River. One thing that we would love for people to do more of is not pour the fats, oils, and grease down the drains. When you're finished eating, don't throw the food into the sink. Actually sweep it into the trash. Things that go into that system have to be cleaned out at some point. So just try to keep it just to water and the things you can't help <laughs> that put go in there. Just so you know, all that water treatment is happening right here in this facility, right now. Joining me is David Clark, the Public Works Director for Fulton County, Georgia. Hey David, tell us about what you do here. Hi Ashley, thanks for having me. I um, am the Director of Public Works for Fulton County, and I manage the transportation, roadways, and uh, water systems in Fulton County. But most of my day I spend making sure that the citizens of Fulton County have safe drinking water to drink, as well as to treat the wastewater that leaves people's homes and goes down the drains, and we clean it here before we return it to the Chattahoochee River. That's a big job, and thanks to you and everyone who works here at Johns Creek Environmental Campus, we have water going back to the Chattahoochee that looks like this, right? That's right. It comes into us looking like this. In a, <clears throat> about 10 hours after it got here, going through the treatment process, it looks like this. And then about a day after it comes to us, we return it to the Chattahoochee looking like that. Looks pretty clear to me, very impressive. And can anyone visit the Johns Creek Environmental Campus to learn about the water treatment process here? Definitely, we love having student troops uh, come through here. Uh, most communities allow students, as well as the general public, to visit their wastewater treatment plants. So I would encourage everybody to uh, reach out to their local community uh, treatment plant and ask for a tour. Just right in their town or city. Fantastic. These places are legit, you guys. I can vouch. So, David, we just learned how wastewater coming in from sewer pipes are treated, but James from St. Luke Middle School wants to know how septic tank water is filtered, specifically septic tanks. Sure. Septic tanks work very similar to the way the wastewater treatment plants work, just on a much smaller scale in your own backyard. The water leaves your house and goes into a couple of different chambers of a tank in your backyard. For there, it gets treated biologically and then gets released back into the ground uh, from your backyard, which then makes its way into creeks, rivers, and those types so of things. So very similarly, it goes back to the water sources. And Millie from Miss Snyder's class at Poplar Road Elementary School wants to know, oh, this is a good one, why is water clear? Basically, water is clear is because it's made up of two gases, hydrogen and oxygen. When those two bond together, they create a clear liquid. It only creates color when other things are added to it, either by purpose or through 
of pollution and other things. Okay, so we want it to be clear. That's healthy water. We have some live questions coming in our iPad. I'll go to those now. Um, let's see, students from Miss Gonzalez's class at Norton Park Elementary wants to know, how long does it take to clean water that is dirty? Sure, like I said, it takes about 24 hours. Each treatment plan has a slightly different process, so some can be treated in about eight or 12 hours, or some take a little bit longer, but 24 hours is usually the rule of thumb. A day. About a day. So much can be done in a day. Samuel, a fifth grader at Union County Elementary asks, what happens to all the dirty stuff that comes into wastewater treatment plants? Just real quick. Sure, most of it just goes back to the landfill. Okay. Okay, well that was a quick answer, I love it. Okay, David, you clearly know your stuff, so you're the perfect person to answer this quiz question. Which of the following is safe to go down the kitchen sink? Here's how our audience responded. Those are the results. Okay, now which option is the correct one? Orange juice. Orange juice is a non-corrosive, non-greasy liquid that won't <clears throat> either corrode, break down your pipes, or it won't clog your pipes either. It's the safer option. So why shouldn't we put medications, fats, oils, and grease, or flushable wipes down the sink? You gotta remember that whatever you flush down the toilet or put down the sink, we have to deal with when it gets to these types of plants. Mm. So we want as natural product as possible. Medications will dissolve in water and the chemicals will stay with the water and we don't want that in our drinking water. Fats, oils, and grease, we call fog, fog. will actually harden over time and create clogs in your pipes. And there's really no such thing as a flushable wipe. You really need to stick to toilet paper. So even if a product says it's flushable, it's really not. Don't trust it. No, it's not. It may be flushing, flushable through your toilet, but once oh. it gets into the system, it will definitely clog your pipes and it creates headaches here at the treatment plant during the treatment process. Which is a problem for you guys. We don't okay. want to cause problems. And we are all about experiments here, so let's give the people some proof, David. Can you sure. show how these different materials behave so differently in water? So you've got a magic wand there. I, I do. Okay. So we have two uh, things in just regular water here. On this one we have toilet paper, and here we have one of those so-called flushable wipes. So-called, he says. <laughs> so what happens during the treatment process, you get a little bit of agitation, and you can kind of see pretty easily how oh, the toilet paper apart. starts falling apart very quickly, and this has just been in the water just for a few minutes. Okay. This actually has been in the water for a couple of hours now, and as you can see, as we do the same type of thing in the flushable wipe, nothing has changed at all. So toilet paper breaks down, Flushable wipes don't break Doesn't down change. because it's a fabric. It's not a paper product. They're fabric? So basically, is that like me trying to flush a t-shirt down the toilet? Exactly. It's almost the exact same type of thing. So that's why we really don't like these in our, in our wastewater. In fact, you have to be careful with paper products. Toilet paper is really the only paper product that should be flushed down the toilet. Other things, paper towels, Kleenex, don't break down as easily as toilet paper, so they can create clogs very similar to the flushable wipes. Those aren't safe either. So like Cheryl said, we gotta stick to only natural things that should go down the toilet, and we know what that means. Okay, Micah from Miss Lacey's sixth grade class at St. Luke Middle School has a question for you, David. Micah wants to know, oh, I love this one, do water filters ever get jammed? Yes. Practical question. Yes, they do. Uh, like any type of filter, it filters out impurities in the water, and over time, there'll be more impurities that make it harder for the water to go through. So you really gotta replace your water filters about every six months. Every six months. Just like any other water filter, it requires maintenance. We have another question. This is from Grayson, a third grader at Woodstock Elementary. He wants to know if rainwater gets filtered to become drinking water and how that works. Sure, and it does. Most of our drinking water in the Atlanta area really comes from rainwater. What we do is we pull it out of the Chattahoochee River, we let it settle out so all the mud and silt and sand gotta come out of the water. We add a little bit of chlorine to it to kill off any bacteria, and then we add fluorine for your teeth and send it out for human consumption. Your dentist loves that. And you guys know chlorine because that's what's in our, our swimming pools. Let's see, we've got one, another one here for you. I like this one too. We may have already addressed that, so let me pick another one. Miss Pratt's third grade class wants to know, is there more water pollution now versus past years? This is interesting because of modern society, right? So what do you say to that, David? 
we certainly know more about water pollution, so we do more things in our daily lives that prevent water pollution. So even though there's more people and that can lead to more water pollution, we're much more conscious of it. So we're hoping that there is less water pollution because people know that it's not something that we need to waste. So we can walk back some of that damage. Bradley from Pleasant Grove STEM Elementary wants to know what would happen if water wasn't cleaned? Simple answer, you would be sick. Okay. There's a lot of bacteria in water. And if we don't take that out, both on the drinking water side and before we put it back into the Chattahoochee after treatments, it would make not only humans sick, but animals sick as well. No, thank you. I have a weak stomach, <laughs> David. I'm not doing that. Get those devices out because here is your final quiz question. Which of the following Georgia crops requires the least amount of water? Is it cucumbers, olives, peanuts or watermelons? You guys know the drill by now. Send us your answer online at gpb.org slash water or text one, two, three or four to the number 430-206-3151. It's time to continue our journey and this time we're headed south to Macon County, Georgia. Take a look. Once you enter the coastal plain of Georgia, you start to see fields. And in those fields are numerous crops. Everything from vegetables to citrus to traditional row crops, they're all grown there. For a farmer here in the coastal plains of Georgia, water and the availability of water is one of the most important factors of production agriculture. It's not an accident at all that our farm is located next to the Flint River. My grandparents and father, when they began farming, sought out a place on a stream that would have water to irrigate with. The Flint River begins at the Atlanta airport. And so everything that goes into that river can conceivably come right by our place and right into the irrigation systems that we operate. I'm happy to tell you that the river is one of the cleaner streams in the state of Georgia. I'm proud of the fact that people north of us are doing a really good job with their cleaning and everything. We have two sources here. Our first source is the Flint River, which is on the eastern side of our farm. And we also have a pond that's been there for over 100 years that we pump out of. And then we use uh, almost exclusively center pivot irrigation that covers large acreages in a circular irrigation system. So historically, we were using things like guns, which had a higher trajectory which were less efficient in how they got water out to the soil. All of our center pivot irrigation systems have drops, which not only gets it lower to the crop, that means less evaporation, but it also means that it's done with less pressure requiring less energy. But these are the kind of things that we think about when we're trying to be efficient in how we use that water because we all value it so highly. Agriculture is the basis for the economy there. And so water then plays a pivotal role in the success of agriculture in the coastal plain of Georgia. And that's why I think it's such an important resource and, and we, we should be focusing our attention on it. The role of the Flint River in agriculture is central in this state. The lower Flint, particularly the Darty Plain, is considered to be the breadbasket of Georgia in terms of, of agricultural production. And that's traditional cotton, corn, and peanuts, but it's also blueberry groves, pecan groves, vegetables. It's a lot of different things. And when you start looking at agricultural value in Georgia, it's really kind of centered up in the lower Flint watershed. And it's because of the abundance of water combined with the soil type, combined with available land, it's just a sweet spot for Georgia ag. 
Water conservation is so important. Drought is a really important thing to think about, uh, no matter where you are on the planet, because it's the time when efficient, conservative use of water is at its most important. It doesn't mean that at other times it's not, but it is at its most important during a drought. What you need to do is move toward using less and less and less, just like electricity. And it's because that water either goes back into the river or into a septic tank and it eventually finds its way downstream. And people need that water not just you and your family, you need to be cognizant, you need to be thinking about the fact that other people are gonna use that exact same water. I'm talking about the same molecules. They're gonna be using it over and over and over again. Protecting water is critical, um, both how clean it is and how much of it there is. We always use the phrase, enough clean water. It's gotta be enough to do the things that we want to do with it, from making money to having fun to just staying alive. And it's got to be clean. And so there's a lot of things you can do. You can join groups like a Riverkeeper and help focus your voice on the issues. What's cool about the Riverkeeper model is that it's not about the river per se, it's about people's connections to the river. So much of our waterways are public in this country, and so the issues are not private, but they're shared by everyone. And there's such a large group of people behind each river here in Georgia that have these special connections to the river. Advocacy groups primarily serve as a focus of citizen voices so that they can become blended into one and bring attention to water policy issues. It's really important to understand where your water's coming from, whether you're on a house with a well or you're on a city system. You need to understand where it's coming from, be reasonable in that use, and then understand where it's going. There's all kinds of responsibility that goes with that water use. It's just like the responsibility of cleaning up your room or driving a car safely so that the people around you are not negatively affected. And we are so appreciative of those who advocate to protect our rivers and help keep our water clean. Thank you. We've talked a lot about the ways that we use water in our everyday lives, but there's one very powerful way water is used, and that's to generate electricity. Here with us now is Hannah Warner, the Energy Efficiency Education Coordinator at Georgia Power. Welcome to the show, Hannah. Thank you. Could you tell us, please, how Georgia Power uses water as a business? Absolutely. So at Georgia Power, we make, move, and sell energy. And water is the backbone of power generation. We rely on it to provide safe, affordable, and reliable electricity for 2.6 million customers across the state of Georgia. It all starts with water. Mm -hmm. I'm sure this concept is generating a lot of questions from our audience at home, like this one from Josue, a student in Miss Hannon's class in Athens, Georgia. He wants to know how water is used to create electricity, the natural next step. In the that is a really good question. So at a lot of our plants, we use the basic principle of using steam to turn a turbine. So we heat up water. The force of that steam will turn this turbine connected to a generator and when the turbine turns wow. it produces electricity that's amazing so instead of my hands imagine steam doing that work so it's really really important that we have water to do that steam is the force behind the mechanics it is. that it makes is. the lights come on mm -hmm. and so once that water is used to generate electricity what happens to it Another great question. So we recycle it and reuse it in a number of ways throughout the plant, but most of the water is returned to the original source. So for example, if we pulled water out of the Savannah River, most of that water is going to go right back in. Just like we talked about with the Chattahoochee, mm -hmm. put it back where you got it mm -hmm. and clean it first. During our program, we talked a lot about conservation efforts that we individuals can take, but what are some ways that Georgia Power is helping to conserve water for your commercial purposes? So we know how important water conservation is to supporting our growing population 
and increasing energy demand in Georgia. That is why we have pledged to the My Drop Counts program by the Metro Water District. And this program really helps us save every drop that we possibly can. So we look at any way we use water in the plant and we try to make it better, more efficient. So we have water efficient toilets, sinks and other fixtures. And at our water research centers, we're finding new and improved ways to use less water in generating electricity, to capture water in all these crazy ways from floor drains, even stormwater runoff, and using that in our power plant. We're also investing in renewable energy. So solar, wind, biomass, all of these generate electricity but they use little to no water. So you're being efficient exactly. every way you can. Exactly. And speaking of being water efficient, Hannah, earlier we asked our audience, which of the following Georgia crops requires the least amount of water? So the answer. What is the answer? They're all delicious, but go ahead and tell us, Hannah. The answer is peanuts. It's peanuts. It's peanuts. So every ounce of peanuts uses 4.7 gallons of water okay. to be produced. So this is way less than cucumbers, olives, watermelon. So not only do we rely on water to produce electricity and keep our lights on, we need it to put food on our table. We do. So what I heard from that was more peanuts, eat more of them, Absolutely. save water, save energy. Okay, we have another question, this time from a teacher. Ms. Hinkle from Oglethorpe Avenue Elementary School wants to know if you like working with elementary students and teaching them about water. Real quick. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Think about how cool it is. I get to show them stuff like this. And the light bulb lights up, and so do the students. Ah, well said. Okay, we have one more that we can ask here. Let's see. Okay. How much water is used every day? This is from Mackenzie, an eighth grader in Miss Davis's class at Lee Middle School. Our everyday use, got a grasp Okay, on that? you are not gonna believe this, but in Georgia, in Metro Atlanta, the average person uses 50 gallons of water a day indoors. So showering, brushing your teeth, doing your laundry, 50 gallons a day. That's a lot of things. Indoor lot of and outdoor usage. Indoor, that indoor. That does feel like a lot. I can't imagine going and getting 50 gallons of milk at this Yeah, time. imagine if you had to carry that around with you. <laughs> carry your water It'd weight. be very heavy. <laughs> Keep those questions coming. So far, we've learned different ways groups and businesses are taking action to protect and conserve water. But what about students? Let's take a look at one of the many ways kids can be good stewards of our environment. Georgia Adopt the Stream is the state's official volunteer water quality monitoring program. It's managed by the Environmental Protection Division. What we do here in Cobb County is train volunteers, so it could be citizens, could be classrooms, schools, anybody who wants to become a volunteer will become trained and certified. We'll teach them how to use the equipment. Here we can loan them the equipment and they'll go out and monitor a stream that they adopt and they'll take these measurements and submit data monthly to an online database. We can take a look at that data and determine if anything is going on with the stream or if it's normal. And over time we see trends and if we see something that just doesn't seem right, we can figure out maybe something's going on and hopefully go out and fix it. In Cobb County, we have over 3,200 miles of stream and waterway. If you line those up end to end, they would line from Atlanta to Los Angeles and partway back. It's pretty impressive how much water we have. Those 3,200 miles of waterway do end up in our drinking water sources, so protecting these small streams is really important because this is really our source of water that we have. The stream is a, a, a body of water, much like a pond or a river or a lake. They can be anywhere from commercial building sites, private property, even where you work or where you shop. There might be a stream out there that you might not even notice is there. Some of these streams have been, over time, driven underground due to development, but that doesn't mean that they're still not there. So whatever you do where you live or where you work or play has effects um, downstream. So the importance of all these streams and protecting them, and when you think about a watershed and how it's 
determined by topography and the lay of the land. Those smaller streams up in the headwater areas really kind of filter together and trickle down, make larger streams. Those merge together and make larger streams, and that ends up being our water source and where we get our drinking water from, and also provides an incredible amount of habitat and biodiversity. So when we protect the smaller streams, we're really protecting the larger rivers and bodies of water. In our case here in Cobb County, you know, it's our lake and Chattahoochee River. So one of the things we do is look for macroinvertebrates in the stream, and they have different tolerances to pollution levels, and those pollution levels, well, actually correlate to dissolved oxygen. One of the organisms that we're probably most familiar with might be the dragonfly. The streams really are nurseries for these organisms, and dragonflies start their life cycle in the water. Some of them can live in the water for up to several, two, three years. When you see a dragonfly, you know that there's probably going to be some healthy water around because they need that to survive. So we have the adopt stream program, and anybody can get involved in that. It's a great way to learn your stream. You go down once a month and visit and really get connected with that stream site. It's certainly a wonderful thing to get to know a plot of land or a section of water. I like participating in adopt stream because I just find it fun and cool what we can find out about the water. I think it's important to take care of our water so we know if it's safe or not and so we have a lot of information on it. My favorite part of today is being able to come out here and experience like firsthand how like the water testing works. It's very fun. Participating in programs like Adopt a Stream is good because it helps teach kids responsibility. That way when they grow up like they have a better understanding of what they need to do to help take care of the world. So by understanding how like, our water works and how it can get polluted and it can be dangerous for us, they might be able to help stop it and be able to pick up trash on like the park and stuff. That way they can help take care of our world. I now feel so energized to help save the world. Yes. Back by popular demand, it's our water woman, Sarah Skinner, to answer more questions from our audience. You ready for this, Sarah? I'm ready. Let's dive in. Right. Ava from Mrs. Lay's fifth grade class at Social Circle Elementary wants to know, do you think we will ever run out of water? Oh, wow. Uh, it's the same water cycling over and over again. So we've got that working for our system. We do have to be careful with how we use it, though. We want to make sure we conserve it as much as possible. Very good. Uh, here's, a, here's an actual statement. My eighth grade class and I are watching from Noonan, Georgia at Lee Middle School. We are curious to how the recent tornadoes have affected our water supply. Can you tell us? That's a good question. And I don't know exactly what happened in the, in the Noonan case or Coweta case, but if it, in the event of a natural disaster, our water systems are always going. You've got people there all the time at the water plant nonstop who are checking and monitoring. Um, so in the case of a natural disaster, they would get it back online as soon as they possibly could. Okay. Jemiah from Bethune Middle School in Folkston, Georgia asks, what kind of animals live in the water? What kind of animals live in the water? There are things that you can see and there are things that you can't see. And we check the health of a stream by looking for the macro invertebrates. Those are the things that we can see. Little bugs, critters, caddisflies, dragonflies, like we heard about, really great creatures. And then the very little bugs, like Cheryl mm -hmm. talked about the bug That's right. party. That's right. Okay. Here's another good one. Miss Baldwin's fourth grade class at East Jackson Elementary wants to know, how does using a garbage disposal affect the water in your sink? or does it? Oh, wow. I okay. love this one. I That's use my garbage good, disposal all the time. That's a good thing. It's a good question. We want to make sure that nothing goes down the garbage disposal, but the things that are naturally coming off of our food, our plates. Um, but the best thing to do is to scrape your plate into the trash can before it even put it into the sink. We don't want to put anything large or solid down the garbage disposal. That's a no-no. So no, 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 no solid foods then? No you solid foods. You scrape that in scrape the trash. Scrape plate and only catch the things that are naturally coming off your plate. Okay, I'll do better, I promise. Diana from Westwood Elementary asks, if river, if river water runs to the ocean, but it is fresh water, why is the ocean salt water? Wow, that is a very good question. <laughs> I may have profound. to Google that one. But I do know that the, when the river flows out to the ocean, there's an area of brackish water where the salt water is mixing. It's mixed. With, yes, it's mixing. I don't know exactly why it's all salty where the fresh water goes, but great question. <laughs> I will look good. it up when I go home. <laughs> Further inquiring is uh, necessary. Janet from Purdue Elementary in Warner Robins, Georgia, would like to know, besides littering, how do people pollute the water? Great question. So pollution can come from things we don't even know. Our car could be leaking oil. Uh -huh. uh, you, you also, when you walk your pet, you should pick up after your pet. That's another big source of water pollution. Um, so it's little things like that. Um, 
yard waste, when we're clipping our gr grass, you know, cutting our grass, those clippings don't need to go down the storm drain. Oh, so, they don't? No. So we get take them to the landfill, trash. Or, uh, yes, or if you have curbside pickup like I do, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. <laughs> Uh, Amana, Amna, and I'm sorry about that pronunciation, in fourth grade at uh, this academy is, okay, let me start this one over. Amana in fourth grade at the Amana Academy in Miss Simon's class would like to know, whew, can I still use water for my science experiments? Yes, of course. You can use water for your science experiments and use water for whatever you need to use water for. We're in the clear then. Yes. That's good to know. I think we have time for some more. Okay. Uh, Brenna, a fourth grader, would like to know, is water wet? Wow, is water wet? That's very philosophical. Um, well, is water wet or do the things that get into the water become wet? That's a good question to think about for yourself, maybe. I don't know the answer. We'll continue pondering that one. Okay. Okay, I think we have time for one more. I'm trying to pick my favorite. Oh, I like this one. I'm a water drinker, okay. as are you, as are we all. Tamara from Clay Harmony Leland wants to know, what is the best water for humans to drink? The best water for humans to drink, always tap water. Always drink tap. tap water, yes. Because we know Cat. that that's been treated. It's been treated, it's readily available, and compared to bottled water, it's mostly inexpensive. <laughs> okay, yeah. it looks like that's all the time we have for today. Thank you, students, for your participation. And a special thanks to our live guests, Sarah, David, and Hannah, as well as the Metro Water District and all of our partners for this very special program. But the fun doesn't have to end here. Learn more about Georgia's water at gpb.org water. I'm Ashley. We'll see you next time with the GPB Live Exploration. Bye-bye. <laughs>